Hi, welcome to Goose is finally excited to make content. Today's mini mysteries will be exploring some awesome stuff that I found while live streaming at twitch.tv forward slash goose underscore boost. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Come and join. Also follow me on Twitter for updates. So before I actually start talking about this, I want to make something extra clear. When it comes to content that I like to make, I tend to talk about subjects that are not super popular as I feel like they should be. The following topics I've got for you today are criminally underrated and honestly deserve more eyes on them. So as always, the links will be in the description if you want to check out these videos for yourself, as I highly recommend you do, or you can just wait after this video to see if they're interesting enough for you to check out later. Either way, I hope you enjoyed today's batch of weird and creepy content given to me by you guys out there for a live stream that I've done these past couple of months, and I hope whatever ails you in your life right now can be alleviated briefly by this short intermission into the depths of YouTube's strangest content creators. Enjoy. Starting off with some classic analog horror content, Greylock is currently one of the creepiest analog horror out there with some genuinely interesting lore and fascinating visuals. It does repeat some all too familiar tropes that many analog horror recycle, but I think there's enough here that is strong on its own that most can kind of ignore the rest. And honestly, most of it just sort of feels like a tribute to those great and wonderful content creators that have made such classic analog horrors, but we'll talk about that at the end of this little dissection that I'm about to do. Created by Rob Gavigan and co-produced by Matt Reeves, the series is sort of all over the place, with many of the tapes, i.e. videos, not chronologically numbered, but rather their individual tapes with several themes and segments, story beats that ultimately connect to each other in some way, shape, or form, rather than chronology. Clearly, there is a narrative to be told, but this series doesn't really make it easy to figure out what it is everything all of this is about, with so much of it still being fresh and new, as well as some of the series being so cryptic in nature. Now, as I said, this series started a few months ago and much of the info I will share with you now might change or may have a different meaning later down the line in the series lifespan, so Instead of solving every little detail shown to us through these tapes, I will instead opt for dissecting these tapes one by one and attaching each new bit of lore that fits with one another whenever possible. Sound good? Right, okay, well, let's start with... Someone is hacking into a laboratory, security cams are active and capture this activity but finds nothing. Many of the cameras shot are confusing, blurry, the computer states what's happening as the hacker gains administrator access despite not having a proper username. Data from this lab is getting extracted and at the end, the logo of Simeodyne USA is shown. Even after watching all these videos, it's currently unclear if this means that data was extracted to Simeodyne or if it was extracted from Simeodyne. Either way, not much can really be gathered from this one tape, although it sets up pretty much the premise of where these tapes came from, this one lab that we're pretty much stealing the information from. So all the tapes you see from now on are just confidential tapes that have been released by a whistleblower. Who the whistleblower is, is currently unknown. But from that, we move on to... Tape zero zero two. Believers, when men pursue evil, it is evil that they will find. This tape features dashcam footage that leads us all the way into a dark forest. The radio is playing a sermon, talking about how man should stray away from the devil's temptation. A man holding the camera is seen traveling deep into the woods. He spots blood in the snow. Suddenly the camera warps into what seems like a new reality. The blood leads to a tree, all the while we hear an almost inaudible voice speaking to us. Oh, 
There are flashes that show us one side of reality to the next, then it all cuts to black and we're back on the road. The sermon continuing, the car getting slower, the surrounding area getting darker, and suddenly, a knock. The car drives faster, the sermon gets slower, more demonic, repeating phrases about the devil. And then it stops abruptly. We now get some background on what it is Simeo Dine USA is, or rather was, their main objective, and the overall lore of Greylock. We're told of Project Stargate, which is the collaboration between Simeo Dine USA and the US Army, specifically Unit 13. The current objective for Project Stargate is to find a way to use thought forms, which are beings manifested through psychokinesis, sort of like stands in JoJo, or as some people call them, tulpas. But they're just, let's be real, they're, they're stands, really, come on. Actually, I'd rather not be reductive. I do like the way they approach the topic of tulpas, as it is common in these kinds of stories to, to sort of just like make up shit and like fluff up stuff that doesn't really make sense in order to make it seem spooky. But in this, I really don't mind it. They have some really interesting ideas as to what they are, tulpas that is, and what we think of them, as well as what they could possibly be. You should watch the video yourself, should you be curious on the more in-depth details that Project Stargate is all about. However, moving on, the people behind Project Stargate have requested the help of a prominent figure in the scientific Tulpa community, a man by the name of Dr. Bernard Hayes. Through their hard work, they've created the Thought Form Manifester, making it easier for people to reach into their minds and manifest thought forms into reality, as the name suggests. Duh. What's really cool is there is apparently a sort of like prison for these thought forms that just sort of exists within this facility. The prison makes sure that the thought forms don't exit through the walls and what do these thought forms look like by the way? Well, it's all up to the imagination really. They can come out as anything and that could lead to some horrifying results that we might see later on. This tape is particularly sinister for many reasons, but without the right context, we can't really understand what's happening here. Though the context won't be given until a bit later, we can at least analyze what's happening here. Someone, possibly a group of people, wait outside someone else's home. They stalk around, checking inside, until they successfully infiltrate the home. And then this happens. our current program at the request of the Massachusetts State Police. Soon after, we see an emergency broadcast alert warning everyone of hungry home invaders coming after your third graders. The broadcast is specifically meant for families that live within Berkshire County, Massachusetts, where most of the story takes place. After this message, something rather horrifying happens. Check a look.
rad. Well, hello again, Tiffany. Oh, hi, Wanda. Nice to see you. This one's pretty short, but confusing if you haven't been paying attention up until this point. We see the ultrasound of a pregnant woman as the baby in her womb suddenly disappears. Just before the disappearance, we see two odd images that flash by. A newspaper clip stating the bizarre happenings in Berkshire County, and unfortunately the small print is practically impossible to read, so no help there. And then there's this face. Ooh. Now, the disappearance of this baby is terrifying, not just in concept, but what it sort of opens up to mean in the grand scheme of things, at least in this story. The participants in Project Stargate were all adults, presumably so, and these are adults with families. What if it's possible that the thought form manifester didn't just do its job correctly? What if instead of just manifesting thought forms, it actually gave the user the ability to manifest any thought forms at will without aid of the machine? After all, there are side effects when using the manifester, none too disturbing or noteworthy, but regardless, these side effects can last upwards to 72 hours. With the device being an experimental machine, it's not too far-fetched to think that maybe there are unknown side effects to this machine one that could potentially unlock thought form manifestation outside of the machine. In any case, could it be possible that either parent of this child could have manifested the baby, and when the baby was finally seen, it disappeared, regressing back to the manifester's mind, or perhaps even escaping the womb? It is, after all, only a ghost. Or stand. Though it's also worth noting rather interesting theories that some users have thought up. Remember previously that all throughout Berkshire County were heard screaming? Well, some commentators had noted that the screaming sounded like either that of children or of women. Or perhaps both. Is it possible that the quote unquote participants of Project Stargate were actually forced to do this? Kidnapped from their own homes and made to manifest thought forms against their will? Do any of them even remember that? Well, let's keep moving forward and we might get the answers to that. Humanity has spent tirelessly past through a great many trials of intellect and fortitude to achieve one singular goal. Starting off right out of the bat with a rather evil sounding symposium by Dr. Bernard T. Hayes, we learn just how ambitious he is about his experiments and research. It goes back to the theming of this whole shebang, the theme of humans poking at the lion's den for more, leading ourselves to self-destruction and the pursuit of knowledge and godlihood. And this is when things get really fucking interesting. Welcome to Simeodyne USA's Virtual Message Assistant, for user, Project Director, Frank Porter. We find the director of this project is Frank Porter, a name I don't think has been brought up previously, but it's a name being used now to play back some messages received by Paul Morelli, a miner from the Morelli Construction and Mining Company. Now, by used, I mean the person who is accessing these files is not Frank Porter, but rather using his name and credentials in order to obtain this otherwise confidential information. I know this because when the machine asks for the password, this is immediately bypassed via permission given by what the machine thinks is the system's administrator. Welcome back, user. Frank Porter. Please enter your credentials. Credential requirement bypassed by system administrator. Greetings, but no user ID. They're only known as unknown user ID. We really don't know who's actually hacking into these files. But in any case, Paul Morelli informs Frank that though things are going smoothly, the miners had reportedly found man-made tunnels that seem ancient. And though they ultimately left it alone, Paul remarked that the tunnels seemed to have working lights and that after a few more of his men explored a bit deeper, they found ancient artifacts. Though, this would ultimately be a mistake, as the crew had progressively grown weaker and had oddly gotten sick from... something. Their food had also gotten bad, almost randomly. Freshly bought produce just seemed to grow maggots overnight. Around the same time, a strange figure had been seen within the woods near the mountains that they had been mining. 
It wasn't clear who or what it was, but the men described the strange figure as some really tall man. Paul hadn't seen this tall man at first, but eventually he did. It had a face. Walking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. Paul, audibly shaken by this encounter, decided to put up hunting cameras around the forest, and that's when this unfolds. After this, Frank makes one final audible call. And listen, I don't know how much of this project's dick I gotta suck for you to check it out, but if you don't want spoilers as to what happens at the end of this tape and experience it on your own, then skip to this timestamp. Otherwise, I'm about to show you one of the coolest and spookiest fucking sequences I've seen in an analog horror in a long time. So please, check it out if you want. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy the last few moments of this video. I feel like I, I need to figure out what's down there. I think whatever's down there could help my crew. But most of all, I, I feel like something really bad's gonna happen if I don't go down. So I'll be going down tonight. <laughs> Message 9. March 30th. Time unavailable. Rad. continue to investigate the recent crime wave that swept across northern Berkshire County. A news reporter talking about the previous kidnapping incidents that occurred in Tape 004 is apparently attributed to an anti-American militia group, and as the tape ends, we'll see the words liar superimposed on the tape by what we'll learn later on to be a hijacker. Obviously, this whole militia story is a cover-up, but the cover-up goes deeper as we see a brief flash of a newspaper that apparently shows that the people around the area have started growing extra limbs, growing out teeth from their scalps, and developing severe psychosis. The area in question, of course, being Berkshire County. By the way, this name is going to be important later on, but let's move on. This is then followed up by a flash of the parents whom we assume belong to the disappearing baby in tape 005. Well, I don't think we can just say assume, we flat out know that this is Tiffany Crisaldi, as her name is mentioned in tape 005, just towards the end of the whole video. And here we see her name and face once again. One last thing to note before we move on to the next tape is that this police officer's interview kind of gives away something pretty important. Look behind them. Mount Greylock. 
This is a real location in Massachusetts, and I'd like to remind everyone that this so far is not an ARG, but rather an analog horror alone. And I'm saying this because I'd really hate it if people just started visiting the area and calling up local joints just to find clues to a story that has so far not asked for audience participation. You might think that's totally unnecessary for me to say, but, uh, you know, so why is this important? Other than it being the name of the series and all that, well, for starters, it's the cause of everything. Remember the mining those suckers did in Tape 006? They mentioned they were digging in an unspecified mountain. But here, we're given a blatant answer. This is a mountain that belongs in Massachusetts, and the series is naming itself after this mountain. So, with all that added up, we can now assume with confidence that this is actually where everything is happening. After all, if you actually look at the mountain in Google Maps, it is right next to Berkshire County, the real life one. This horrendous stuff that's happening to the people within this county has always been attributed to Mount Greylock. Something was awoken in this mountain and it's causing havoc to everyone nearby. Everyone within this area is going to face some horrible Pharaoh's curse like shit if they haven't already. After all, this story happens in the late 80s, maybe even sometime in the early 90s. And I say this because we really don't know how much of the Greylock incident has been covered up and for how long. We don't even know how much of Berkshire has been affected by this. We just know that there are some horrible mutations and strange paranormal events happening around the area, but that's sort of been drip fed to us. There could be more stuff that has sort of been hidden underground, purposely so. But we get a more deeper explanation with... Well, that broadcast went completely tits up, didn't it? The tape starts off where the previous tape left off, showing us the broadcast network executives arguing on how the channel had been hijacked, acknowledging the end of tape 007, and trying to understand what happened. Don, the host of his own show, Don Wright Tonight, could not be contacted. With this in mind, Liam Hollander, one of the execs, then goes looking for him at his own home. We'll get to that in a moment. Afterwards, we get a personal log created by Arnold Eugene Rivers, an anthropologist and archaeologist hired by the CD figures behind Project Stargate, which he refers to the Greylock Project, confusingly enough, but that's probably because the Greylock Project is more about the mining and excavation instead of the Tulpa stuff that Project Stargate is more focused on. Though, don't be fooled, these two are connected with each other. He largely notes the strange artifacts and various other ancient items found within Greylock's mines and tunnels, all of which come from several different cultures and religions, stemming from Mesoamerican to Paleoamerican, to even much farther cultures such as Egyptian, Viking, Spanish, etc. Those cultures and more who have some sort of artifact within these tunnels are mentioned, though why they're there or what this means is largely unknown. But Arnold hypothesizes that all these items were given to this mountain, this deep into this mountain, as... We then briefly see more of WRAV's programming. The show that was on briefly was called Cosmic Mysteries, which at this point was giving us a brief lesson on how the Earth and the Moon were born. Not much can be said here, except for this brief staticky part. Kind of looks like, I don't know, a face. I mean, doesn't it? No. But if that really is a face, then this whole little history lesson on how the moon and Earth kind of collided and created each other is probably hinting at what exactly is happening here in this story. But for now, we'll be moving on from this, mainly because I don't have any evidence moving forward from what I've seen that sort of connects these two together. But from there on, we hear a disturbing phone call made by Liam Hollander, where he had found his coworker Don Wright and his own home. Hill Road in Adams, uh, number 491. 491 Parker Hill Road, is that right? Yes. Okay, can you tell me, is anybody hurt? Liam, are you still with me? Yes, 
From here, Arnold continues to explain more of what was found in the tunnels, all the strange oddities of the tunnels themselves, how these cultures and people of history must have worshipped something in this mountain, something that they all feared. It's unknown what, but Arnold definitely feels like there is something there, and it's beginning to gnaw at his mind. Huh. You know, this, this is really starting to remind me of At the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft. Y'all ever read that? But you should. Or you could just watch Mouth of Madness if you want something good. <laughs> Man. H.P. Lovecraft. So what an overrated motherfucker. Afterwards, we get to see what exactly happened to the crew that were part of Project Greylock. All of them have been physically deformed and or suffering a severe amount of psychosis. Some have it way worse than others, transforming themselves into what are essentially ghouls or straight up SCPs in some manners. This dude can spit up acid like fucking Reptile from Mortal Kombat. That's the illest shit I heard, but tragic, I guess. Arnold continues on being thankful that he wasn't affected like the rest of the crew, but has noted a sense a paranoia has developed in himself because now he's pretty much terrified of being caught as he is now a whistleblower trying to unveil the truth of what happened on Mount Greylock. Going so far as to hiring a private eye to investigate what he has told him. The same one mentioned by the way in tape 007 when the newspaper flashed up on screen. Jim Meldrin. Just as Arnold feels relieved to get this all off his chest, he hears a noise. And realizing that this is an analog horror series, he frantically looks for his camcorder <laughs> and, I'm sorry, uh, he frantically looks for his camcorder to amp up the spooky vibes. <laughs> I love analog horror and this is what occurs. Accessing GBS properties, 101, WRAV, FM, radio station. Date of broadcast, December 13, 1963. Segment, announcement of the National Access Initiative. Beginning playback. This is the latest and newest tape to come out of this channel as of this recording. So, now you're all up to date. Unfortunately, this one leaves us with a lot more questions than answers, so we're probably going to wait for a little while until we can actually get something substantial in the near future. But for now, let's talk about 009. It starts off with what seems to be an old news program from WRAV, talking about Lyndon B. Johnson's initiative to give eligible households a myriad of technology in order to further advance the progression of American living. Seems mundane at first, until you realize the people responsible for supplying these pieces of technology is Cineodyne. Newspapers flash up on screen showing former President Kennedy's disapproval of Cineodyne, and then later showing a blurb of his assassination, implying that the assassination was orchestrated by not only Cineodyne, but President Johnson as well. In fact, it's kind of flat out said, as later on in the tape, we actually hear a secret audio recording of the CEO of Cineodyne at the time, explaining how they will, if not already have, killed President Kennedy. Kennedy didn't go for it. But you assured me he was a medical. Was that just more of your bullshit? Well, he's gonna fucking expose our whole plan for the NAI program. The meeting couldn't have gone worse. 
If that fucking neck thinks he's going to expose Simeon, he's got another thing coming. But we're not the only ones he's pissed off lately. After rejecting Operation Northwoods, and then that executive order involving the Federal Reserve, there are a lot of snakes in the grass. And it's about time that Kennedy got bit. It's made clear through the flashing surveillance footage that this whole setup of giving Americans technology in order to advance the progression of future living, whatever, is sort of bullshit. And it's honestly just made to spy on American households. For what can't really be made too clear as of this story. And this is decades before the Greylock incident, so it's really hard to say what the motivation was. But aside from the flashes of people's homes, we also get a flash of a red masked figure and another flash of a group of masked figures in the woods. It's unknown what this could mean. For all we know, these could be the guys that snuck into everyone's homes and started kidnapping people. Were they part of that mass home invasion that occurred in Berkshire County? Hmm, I don't know. Finally, the last segment of this video has to do with a thought form. Remember those? That was a little while ago. Invading the home of a young child. The young child in question being Katie. It doesn't seem like she's anyone noteworthy as of right now, but Katie does confirm that, yes, even children were involved in Unit 13, aka Project Stargate. Are you from your doctor's office place that I had to go to? Now, this whole segment is actually beautifully done and well executed. I'm not even gonna show it. I want y'all to actually experience it on your own. Anyways, the tape ends with a phone ringing and well, that's all we have for now. There is a lot to unpack with all of these videos. And honestly, I omitted some details and some other visual stuff that I'd rather you guys experience on your own. The community is still very young, and I honestly think the funnest part about, is that even a word funnest? I think the funnier part about exploring these kinds of analog horrors is, well, the community. So it would be nice if everyone gave it a shot, you watched it on your own, come up with your own theories, and make a comment on what you think happened in those videos, and what it all could mean at the end. But the series is still going on. So many things are probably left in the shadows still. And honestly, I'm just excited to see what happens next. This has become genuinely one of my favorite analog horror series in a long, long time. Now, I feel like I've said that in the past about a few other things that I've recently covered, but I'm gonna be real here. It's been a good fucking year for online horror content, seriously. But Greylock isn't like any other series I've seen. Well. Actually, that's not true. It's like a lot of other series I've seen, but I can see that it's done on purpose and almost as if it's a love letter to analog horror as a whole. I mean, seriously, there's so much effort and love put into it. I can really see where they took inspiration with every single one of these videos. You can tell that this was made by massive fans of not only analog horror, but a fan of online horror culture in general. It's giving a little bit of everything. It's got clear inspirations from Local 58 to Marble Hornets, Gemini Home Entertainment, Mandela Catalog, Monument Mythos, SCPs, even stuff like Skinwalkers. Like, this has so many shades of inspirations from so many other projects, but it doesn't feel tacked on or lazily added as it sometimes feels with other projects that are also inspired by analog horrors that are super popular. I mean, it kind of makes sense. This is made by Rob Gavigan. He's the horror dude that's been making a career on YouTube for a long time now and has amassed over 3 million subs. Of course he knows what he's talking about. Of course he's a fan of this sort of dark, eerie shit. And of course he knows what he's doing. In fact, I didn't like this series at first solely because I thought it was just clearly inspired by all those series that I just listed and didn't really have its own footing. But I was immediately proven wrong when I actually sat down and watched the rest of the series because honestly, the lore is interesting and genuinely pretty freaky and at times downright scary. It's something I feel even jaded fans of analog horror can find appreciation with. It is well crafted, 
well done. The acting is surprisingly well done. The lengths that it has gone to just to be as authentic as possible is insane. And really, I just think this series deserves more of a chance than what it's currently pulling. I've said this so many times, but I wholeheartedly recommend you watch this series on your own. If you're a fan of analog horror, and even if you were once a fan of that sort of media and you just sort of lost interest, I promise you, it is like the sloppiest and horniest love letter to online horror that I've seen in a while, and it stands on its own as a beautifully crafted and genuinely creepy piece of fiction. The playlist will be in the description down below. Check it out. Give Rob and Matt a kiss from me, preferably on the lips and on the forehead and on the top of the head where the... But anyways, enjoy the rest of the series as it continues to unfold. Not Your Normal Kid Show is a YouTube series created by BVK, BLT, an up and coming content creator with a rather massive following on TikTok and Instagram. So I guess saying that they're an up and coming content creator is kind of a lie. I don't give a fuck. Anyways, the series stars a redheaded clown lady with her, I guess, friend named the Tall Man as she hosts this seemingly unnamed show. Though we can't assume it's called Not Your Normal Kids Show, the fact is this show has no real name to it. We're not even really sure what it's about. Sure, we have some of your basic stuff like doing your laundry, eating right, planting flowers, and not opening the door to strangers. But shit gets real fucked during each and every one of these episodes, such as the aforementioned plants turning into horrible zombie hands as the screen glitches, an occurrence that happens frequently that often changes the nature of the video itself, sort of like giving a glimpse of the true reality lurking underneath this facade of a clown fuckery. There does seem to be a sort of thinly veiled messaging with each of these videos, mainly pertaining to content creation and the thin line between creating and creator, but with this series being super new and with only eight episodes available, it's super hard to really pin down what the story is, if there even is one. But I'll try to dissect it as much as I can because I'm the illest and spookiest content creator around. To start off with this messy little dissection, we need to talk about the most prominent figure in this whole mess, which is our main clown gal, who has no name whatsoever. At least, it's not totally obvious what her name is, not until episode 6, where she finally reveals her real name in a very cryptic manner. Silly, you already know my name. See? It's pronounced... Translating this from Morse code, it means Dottie. Yeah, that probably should have been obvious by now, but hey, whatever. There are some things to note about Dottie. First of all, in all of these videos, she doesn't really seem all that enthused to be part of these shorts. While she has a smile on her face most of the time, we do have moments where she seems straight up frightened for her life. Her pupils shrink whenever she encounters certain things, such as spiders or a horrifying forest creature, showing that even Dottie is afraid of her surroundings, almost like she doesn't really want to be there. There are even points where her voice, while cheery at times, can have this sort of swallowed, almost agitated tone. Take a listen where she tells you that you're too early for the show to start, for example. show starts at a specific time. You should remember that. Let's get started then, shall we? It's pretty sarcastic and kind of annoying. I, I think it's clear that she doesn't really enjoy making these shorts, almost like she's a prisoner in making these. That's made more clear with episodes like episode 4, where the back of her head is shown to have another face, one that's deformed and looks almost tired looking with a strange dotted pupil. Almost like her vision is obscured, both figuratively and literally, especially since this face is, again, at the back of her head, covered by hair. But Dottie, of course, is not our only character, as we also have the creator of these shorts as well, that being B.V. Key, 
as they are one in the same. It's a character that she plays, not just in real life, but in this little series as well. In episode two, we see BV Key in her room, alone, listening to music. This is when she hears a knock on the door and is given a letter that reads, let the tall man in. The tall man being another prominent character whom we'll talk about shortly. For now, what's important to note is that the tall man is an oppressive figure that seems to loom over her life and at the end of this episode, seemingly kidnaps her. In the description, we can see that this is the origin story of this entire series, but the origin is still kind of unclear. However, if we explore the character of the tall man, we can get some answers as to what this whole series really is about, but explaining who he is is, well, tricky. It seems Dottie isn't really intimidated by the tall man himself, treating him as sort of a friend, but it's clear to us that tall man doesn't really treat Dottie the same way. He can sometimes be antagonistic, threatening even, usually when Dottie gets out of line or maybe even out of character. Sometimes the tall man is missing, and it's stated that you shouldn't let the tall man in. Though rather than asking who the tall man is, we should be asking what he represents, because he doesn't really seem like he wants to kill or even seriously hurt Dottie, but it also seems like he's not a friend of hers either. If I had to make assumptions, I believe the tall man is more of a business partner to Dottie than anything. Now how did I get to that conclusion? Well, I think it's worth reading between the lines with this series. Again, I must reiterate that this is a young series. Things could change from here onwards as the series progresses. So I am interpreting the series with what I have now. And I think this series is all about content creation and the toxic nature of constant creativity. Now you can disagree and approach this series at its face value, but the way I see it, I think Dottie is a representation of people online who play characters, mask themselves as something that they're not. Even when said person doesn't really want to be that character or really feel like doing it anymore. Most importantly, I think it represents that dark and somewhat disturbing era of YouTube where kids content was uncurated and mainly trash. I mean, yes, it's kind of still trash. In fact, mostly trash to this day. Not much has changed, but during that weird time where Elsa's Spider-Man shit was thriving, I think making kids content was just a much easier and fruitful endeavor for even lazy people. Kids were exposed to some heinous and gross shit out there. I mean, YouTube Kids app, like I said, still has some weird and sometimes unbelievable amount of shit just lurking around. It's very low effort and can really be traumatizing to some kids nowadays, but I, I think the messaging behind this is twofold. Not only is it a commentary on the shitty, sometimes horrific kids content people make today, but it's also a commentary of what content creators face when having to constantly talk about something new and creative. It drains you quite a bit, and I've discussed this earlier this month with a video I made. Yet sometimes you feel tethered, if not totally chained, by your work here, because you ain't got anywhere else to go. And that's why Dottie seems kind of like a hostage to the tall man who, with his business suit and very tall visage, represents the people who do business behind the scenes, the people upstairs. You know, those guys. YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, whatever social media you dwell in and make your living on, you can expect that those kind of faceless entities just exist there and only care about one thing, and that's the content you pump out. They're not outright trying to destroy your channel or your chances at success, but they don't make it easier either. They hold you on a leash, making sure that you do make content, but they're also not friendly about it. When you cross that line, you're at risk of being in trouble, possibly facing termination. It's why we see the tall man abducting the creator of the series so that she's forced to make content whether she likes it or not. It's why Dottie has a tired look on her face, at least at the back of her head, because at the back of her mind, she's contemplating whether making this content is worth it. It's why that same face is veiled up by their hair and the eyes are dotted, because now the creator is literally blurring the lines between their character and their real life. It's why when you approach her without her knowing that you're there, she gets annoyed because she doesn't want you to see that part of her. Not only that, but there's also the creepier aspects of this whole series. The spooky little sun, the strange alarm clock, the awful spiders, they just seem really out of place and have pretty much no symbolic meaning whatsoever, at least not to me. But I think in my interpretation at least, I think this also represents what Dottie and in extension the creator really want to do. Sure, it's easier for them to make kids content, but I think these thoughts they have, these 
creepier aspects of their show that slowly eke their way into the series are just manifestations of what B.V. Key wants to make. She wants to be scary, she wants to be spookier, to the point where there are these glitches that sort of give you a glimpse of what she wants to do. There's even an interesting point in episode 7 where a wolf is approaching Dottie and she seems scared for her life and something is about to happen when the tall man appears and suddenly the wolf vanishes. The tall man being a manifestation of the more corporate side of these websites would obviously not want Dottie to make this sort of content because well, I don't know if you guys know this, but making creepy content on YouTube can be a fucking nightmare sometimes. Like guess what? Creepy content is sometimes violent and deals with dark subjects matter so of course that makes it a lot harder to monetize and sometimes these videos get suppressed with that in mind it's obviously more preferable for creators to make family friendly content so that it's easily monetized and discoverable even if it is low effort and not exactly what most content creators want to do or make regardless though this is what sells so to speak and reaching a wider audience as seen in episode 8 where Dottie is seen talking to a younger man who's up really late at night just watching TV I think this episode represents a parasocial relationship one obtains when making this sort of content. I mean, most of us probably watch TikTok or YouTube shorts or even Twitter or I mean, I guess X, whatever, I don't give a fuck. We go to these websites or these apps right before we go to sleep, getting absorbed by nonsense and sometimes a certain person's content. We are absorbed with this person we don't know and start binging their stuff rather than actually going to sleep. I mean, it's definitely deep commentary, but again, I can't stress this enough. This is my interpretation. I could be looking at this way deeper than the creator intended. Maybe this really is just about a clown facing horrible nightmares in this horrible ghoulish world. Maybe it's about something else entirely. Or maybe there's a story buried within that that I just totally missed. Which of course leads me to one character that is seldom mentioned but definitely present, that being Mother. Mother baffles me a bit. I don't really know what she represents in my theory. She's a creature that has a strange diet and seems to scare Dottie quite a bit. In episode 5, Dottie is seen feeding her mother baby tomatoes, I, I don't know what they're actually called, and chicken, quote unquote, which is very clearly a carved face. In episode 7, we see Mother wearing that face very briefly. What this could mean, or what Mother represents, I'm not really sure. Maybe she represents the hopes and dreams that she never got to accomplish. Maybe it represents a literal overbearing mother that wants to see her daughter succeed where she couldn't. Who knows? Honestly, much of the series mysteries have been unsolved and there's a lot of clues and hints that I just didn't bother mentioning because they don't really make sense at the moment or because I feel like this would be a fun little channel to revisit sometime in the future when it's actually complete that is. So I encourage all of you to check out this series while it's still going. The links will be in the description. Watch these yourselves, solve these riddles on your own or with the small community that this has cultivated and make sure to show the series some love because with the amount of attention and care given to the series so far, it's really obvious that there's so much work put into this. And honestly, I'm just glad I got to talk about something that's not an analog horror. Sorry, Greylock. I love you a ton, but only as a friend. Sorry. Even if it was, I, I feel like it'd succeed either way, this little series, because it's interesting, and it's got a lot of weird things about it that I really want to see flourish in the future. So, check it out.